Um, and and what, the, what these creeds and councils are doing and why we use them in the church is we're actually saying, if you hear anything contrary to this today, right, it is wrong, <laughs> right? And not only that, but you should probably bring it up. Like, whoa, whoa, um, right? And this is, this, is, uh, this is how as laymen even, we can say what, what you said there is wrong, not because I think so, but because the church throughout the ages has said so. And all, all elders are, are shepherds in the apostolic tradition proclaiming the same gospel as Paul preached, right? As That's what Paul says to Timothy, preach the gospel that I taught you. Preach my gospel. That's what we're doing. And we're, we're showing you the guardrails of that orthodoxy in these creeds and councils. Um, so real quickly, I wanted to read uh, a church in the early 4th early, uh, century. <clears throat> this is shortly after the Council of Nicaea. Any... Okay, Ritish can't answer this. Um, anyone want to uh, tell me when the Council of Nicaea was? What year? No. What? I said you can't answer. No. 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 One dollar, Bob. Okay. <laughs> 325. 325 AD. Three, 325, right? 325. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and that's pretty early, right? I mean, that's fourth century. That's you know, that's not that long. It seems like a long time, but it's yeah, right. But you, but think about like the Reformation. Uh, Reformation for us was five hundred years ago, minus hundred years. That's that's the the time between the uh, Christ's crucifixion, resurrection, and and the Council of Nicaea happening. You, you think of all the the documents that we have, the knowledge that we have of the reformers is is extensive. Uh, and we think because we're modern and we have all these digital copies of things that we have more information than they probably did about than they did about people 400 years ago. And I'd say uh, that's not true. They had there's a scribal tradition that was robust, and uh, people wrote a lot of things down. And you have a lot of we had a lot of evidence from back then, all that stuff. We have a lot of the canons and things that they talked about in Nicaea. Um, so a lot of people attest that as being that's the first council that the church came together and, and did anything with. And of course, we would say no. But I, I want to read a, uh, this is a, a smaller synod. Uh, if anyone is unfamiliar with the word synod, it's really just a smaller type of council. It's like a regional council and not a, 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 uh, a ecumenical council. Ecumenical would be the church, all the churches from all the areas coming to one place. A synod would be like a meetings of the churches in Las Vegas. Versus the meetings of the churches in the United States. Yeah, Synod of Dort would be one of those. That's in the, Nether the churches of the Nether Netherlands. Lutherans, Lutherans right? Um, a lot of even the confessions that we read are, are synods, right, that formed. And then other churches adopted those things. Again, this is kind of the, the, the downward part of the Reformation. The Reformation gave us salvation back, <laughs> but, it, but the Reformation fractured the church, uh, Big time uh, to where uh, and a lot it, it's kind of chaotic, right? And you have these regions adopting these, the Helvetics, uh, the Helvetic uh, Confession over here, and you have the Belgic over here, and the Heidelberg over here, and everyone's trying to fight heresy, right? But it's kind of it's fractured now. Uh, it's not as unified. So uh, what we're going to look at is is the creeds and councils that we have from what is called uh, the undivided church. Um, and, and this is the church that prior to uh, 1054, which would be the split between East and West, but obviously before the Reformation, uh, which is uh, in 1517. Um, so I'm going to read a church that deviates from uh, confessional orthodoxy. And I want you to see how the church reacts to, to this particular church that is deviating. So, so this, uh, this was a smaller synod, right? This is a a small collection of churches that met um, shortly after the uh, Council of Nicaea. Uh, and it's the Synod of, of Gangra, right? Um, and the church in that area had left the Orthodox faith, okay? Um, and they're going to write a letter, the, uh, the synodical letter of the Council of, of Gangra. 
Um, and I'm going to read this letter. It's not that long. But I want you to, to listen and, and look at what the church is accusing, what the synod is accusing this particular church of doing and how they're deviating from orthodoxy and their, what, their, what this church is teaching and um, practicing, even in their liturgy, right? Okay. Eusebius, that people think Eusebius wrote this letter. We're not really sure. Um, it's going to list a bunch of names. Olympius, Bythesius, Gregory, Philetus, Pappus, Ulysses, Hepitus, Basil, or Basil, um, assembled in, in the Holy Synod of Gungra. To our most honored lords and fellow ministers in Armenia, wish health in the Lord. For as much as the most holy synod of bishops assembled on account of certain necessary matters of ecclesiastical business, church business, in the church of Gangra, on, on inquiring also into the matters which, concerns, which concern Eustathius, this is the elder of this church. Eustathius is the elder that they're condemning here of this church. Found that many things have been unlawfully done by these very men who are uh, partitions of Eustathius, it was compelled to make definitions which it has hastened to make known to all for the removal of whatever has by him been done amiss. So all, they're going to name all the things that they are doing, uh, proclaiming that is unbiblical. For from their utter abhorrence of marriage, so th this particular church thinks that marriage is a sin. No one should marry. Uh, any sexual relate this is very Gnostic. You're going to start hearing some Gnostic ideas here. Um, for from their utter for their adhorrence of marriage and from their adoption of the prostitution or proposition that no one living in a state of marriage has any hope towards God. So if you're married, you're in sin. You have no hope. Uh, you're a perpetual sin if if you stay with your spouse. Um, many have misguided many married women. They have forsaken their husbands and husbands their wives. So everyone just starts divorcing each other. Marriage is condemned and everyone starts divorcing. Right? Um, then afterwards, not being able to contain their lusts, their passions, they have fallen into adultery. So they start taking their passions out on each other. And so through such a principle as this have come to shame. They were found moreover fomenting separations from the houses of God and from the church, treating the church and its members with disdain and establishing separate meetings and assemblies and assemblies in different doctrines uh, and other things in opposition to the churches. So, okay, to the churches. So you have this church in particular, particular going off, creating their own assemblies, their own little synods themselves, and enacting uh, decrees and doctrines that deviate from the church. So that, that automatically means there's already guardrails in place. Scripture, obviously, is that the thrust that builds the track, right? And these, and these churches are keeping the guardrails. This one church has deviated, or, and they're over here. So this isn't just one church saying, I think you're wrong. This is churches saying, um, you have deviated from Holy Scripture and what you're doing. And by the way, in a church, this can happen really quickly, you even see the, uh, them accusing them of, of having secret assemblies and, and stuff like that, creating their own doctrines. This can happen very quickly in churches when we have little cliques that start meeting, right? Uh, and we have, like, they start becoming their own little church, and they meet on certain days of the week, and then, like, doctrines form in this church versus the rest of the church, and then you start seeing fractures in the church, right? Um, this is something that happened back then. It's something that happens today. And it's something as a church uh, in our liturgy, when we're, when we're using these confessions and creeds that we're saying, you know, this stuff can't happen. This is not what an Orthodox church does. And those things which are done in the church, wearing strange apparel to the destruction of the common custom of dress. This is important. Listen to this. Making distributions among themselves and their adherents as saints of the first fruits of, first fruits of the church, which have from the first been given to the church. So they're starting to wear, uh, they're going against Paul's teaching and the Corinthians of, of, of modest dress for women, right? Uh, uh, not being adorned with jewelry, but their adornment being their temperament and their love for the Lord and, and uh, submissive and stuff like that, right? 
So Paul's saying those are the things that adorn women. This church is actually taking that and saying, well, we're not going to do that for sure because they're not marrying, they're committing adultery, uh, and they're going to start wearing clothes that we'll see here in a second actually are an attempt to subvert the difference of the sexes, men and women, identifying them as men and women. It's going to sound very similar to, the, to today. Um, they're teaching them that slaves also leaving their masters. So remember, Paul teaches if you are a, if you are a slave to a to a Christian master that you are that you are to obey your master, even if he's even if he's an unbelieving, harsh master, right? You are to obey, uh, not for his sake, but for God's sake, right? The church is teaching slaves that they should they should sever that tie to their masters and run away. Um, there, what book in in the New Testament actually um, suggests that? is not what a Christian should do, a Christian slave. What book? Huh? Yes, Philemon, yes. Yep, that, that was a slave's name, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have, we, even, we have a book like, no, you know, we are, we are called to do this. This church is saying, no, no, you can break that tie. Be chaotic here. Slaves leaving their masters, and on account of their own strange apparel, uh, acting instantly towards their masters. Women, too, disregarding decent custom, and instead of womanly apparel, wearing men's clothes, <laughs> thinking to be justified because of these. Why would a woman, why do you think a woman will wear men's clothes? Right, what are they, what, what's the message they're sending? It's about authority, it's about authority right? They're not, a biologist. they're not a biologist, clearly. No one's a biologist. Um, yeah, they're 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 shucking their authority, right? It's a statement saying, uh, "I am not under anybody. I am of equal standing," right? Um, wearing men's clothes, thinking to be justified because of these, while many of them, under a pretext of piety, cut off the growth of hair, hmm. which is natural to women. All right. Um, this is a clear teaching in 1 Corinthians when we're talking about, and I know there's different views here about head coverings, um, but the early church has a specific view of it, so I'm just going to address what their view of it is here. And their view of it is the hair. The hair is the head covering of the woman. That is the glory of the woman. The long hair is saying that in, in her role, she is submissive to the man. Right. So you have, you have this church now teaching that women are allowing e even women to wear men's clothing, um, subverting the authority uh, of men, and also cutting their hair, another clear message of authority, um, which is natural to women, and these persons were found, these persons were found fasting on the Lord's Day. That's kind of interesting, um, just side note. The reason they thought that was wrong is because fasting is for mourning. You don't fast on a day that is joyful. So you don't fast on the day when the Lord is risen. That's, that's when you don't, that's when you feast, right? Um, so they actually saw fasting on the Lord's Day as, they'll actually say, if anyone fasts on the Lord's Day, they are anathema. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's the early church, right? They're pretty harsh. Um, <laughs> um, but actually, they were teaching that, that you, you can fast on the Lord's Day. Uh, at this church, when we fast, we do Friday, Friday evening to Saturday evening. Um, and we can talk about why we do that later, but that's how we do it here. Uh, despising the sacredness of that free day, but disdaining and eating on the fast appointed in the church. So, again, this is an idea that the church appoints when we should fast. I think you guys saw this uh, last week when the elders said, hey, we are going to fast on this day. We are calling you guys to join us. Um, an appropriate thing to do, I think, uh, in our app, there's like a little pray thing, and every, like the hands together, and everyone uses that, I think. Um, I think it would be encouraging to actually... Uh, Respond if you are going to do it. Remember, you don't have to. There's some people that can't. We're not saying you have to, uh, but if you if you do want to join in the church on the days that we appoint for fasting, do a response. Hey, I'm with you. Right. That's going to encourage other people, um, and that way we can we kind of know what's going on. It's not like we're still being secretive. I know some people are like, well, I don't want anyone to know that we're fasting. That's not what we mean, right? You, people can know. We're announcing when we're going to fast. Um, Anyway, uh, and this this all has a point. I know this is this is this is this is showing how a church can go off the rails, and we're going to see how creeds uh, keep us 
on the rails and then identify churches that are off the rails. Um, and, certain of their ad- and certain of them adhor the eating of flesh. Um, that's not eating meat. Uh, neither do they tolerate prayers in the houses of married persons, but on the contrary, despise such prayers when they are made and often refuse to partake uh, when oblations are offered in the houses of married persons. <laughs> I know. This is what legalism does. You see how it's like completely outside the law? Uh, um, uh, contemning, contemning married presbyters and refusing to touch their ministrations. Condemning the services in honor of the martyrs and those who gather or minister therein. And the rich also who do not alienate all of their wealth as having noth- nothing to hope from God. Um, very Marxist understanding, right? Um, if you're rich, you have to give all your money up, uh, right? <laughs> that was happening back then. Um, and many other things that no one could recount. So these are just a few of the, of the unorthodox craziness that this church was doing. For every one of them, when he forsook the canon of the church, adopted laws that tended, as it were, to isolation. So they they reject God's law, they create their own, and now they've isolated themselves outside of the church of God. Their candlestick has actually been removed. Uh, When he forsook the can, um, uh, for for neither was there any common judgment among all of them, but whatever anyone conceived that he compounded to the scandal of the church and to his own destruction. We're almost done. Wherefore the Holy Synod presented present in Gangra was compelled on these accounts to condemn them and to, and to set forth definitions declaring them to be cast out of the church, but that if they should repent and anathematize every one of the false doctrines, then they should be uh, capable of restoration. Right? Very important. Um, even in, even in our, our guardrails of orthodoxy, Right? We're calling these churches to repentance. And, and therefore, the Holy Synod has particularly set forth everything which they ought to anathematize before they are received. They list all the things that need, they, they need to repent of. Um, churches should be doing that today, by the way. Some churches do. But churches that are doing this kind of stuff, Orthodox churches should be saying, like, repent or you're outside of the church. And, <laughs> um, we don't really do that today because the church is so fractured. And if, uh, if anyone will not submit to the said decrees, he shall be anathematized as a heretic. You can see, like, uh, even here, like, you can see how, as a church, how, how slow we are to, to really name anyone a heretic, right? We, we call them out. We, we show them where they're wrong. We wait for them to repent. And then if they don't, if they understand the argument, they see they're wrong, and then they refuse, now they're a heretic, right? They're not a heretic for saying it initially. They're wrong, and they're in sin, they're not a heretic yet, right? Uh, we need to be care- and the church is very uh, uh, ungracious in how they label people heretics and stuff these days. Um, uh, will be anathematized as a heretic and excommunicated, and cast out of the church. That's taking and removing the, the candle out of the, out of the uh, lampstand. And it will behoove the bishops to observe a like rule in respect of all who may be found with them. Um. I wanted to read one of the canons. Um, this is canon, let's see, uh, 15, this is canon 17. And again, I'm not doing this because I know, I know somebody here had different views on head coverings. This isn't for the purpose of saying they're wrong or anything. I'm just, I'm just reading what, what this synod understands as that verse to be saying. Um, but in this canon, uh, here's, here's what it reads. If any woman... Uh, from pretended aestheticism shall cut off her hair, which God gave her as a reminder of her, subje- her subjection, thus annulling as it were the ordinance of subjection, let her be anathema. Um, and then uh, uh, one, of the, one of the commentaries on that part, the Apostle Paul in the first epistle of the Corinthians represents the long hair of women, which is given to them as a natural veil as a token of their subjection to man. Uh, when we learn from the synod, from that, this synod, that is, uh, this church uh, encouraged women to cut off their hair 
uh, to, to send a message of their rejection of, of the patriarchy, essentially. Um, and we're, obviously, we see that today in many other ways than just cutting off of hair. Right? We see the general dysphoria. There's a gender dysphoria here. Um, but again, how do we know which church? Because there's churches that literally do this. This, this church and, and that is being condemned. Um, th- this is actually a liturgy. All the things I just read that are anathematizing is a liturgy for the other churches. <laughs> that's what they teach. That's what they, uh, that's what they pray for. And that's, that's what their liturgy looks like. They're not reading any of these creeds and councils because, again, the, the, the creeds and councils will go against them. There will be a witness against them. Um, so I wanted to read that because it's important to look at uh, what, <laughs> what can happen when you're not within orthodoxy, when you don't have those guardrails. It can be very easy uh, to go off. Um, and once you start going off, momentum takes you, and it's really hard to change that direction. <laughs> it really is. Um, and that's why you got to be very careful. Um, all right, so this begs the question, right? I think uh, we can ask, well, what creeds are we going to use in our liturgies? What are we going to what are we going to present to the church to say this is this is what we believe, this is what we teach, and this is where we stand. We stand with the church throughout history in this doctrine, basic doctrines, right? Um, Christology, uh, the Trinity, uh, incarnation doctrines, right? What what are we going to read in church? Um, some of you might already know a few of them because we have read them recently. One of them is the Apostolic Creed. Right? Um, Apostolic Creed is probably one of the earliest uh, creeds after the Council of Jerusalem. And uh, really, it's, it's, it was, we, we don't really know who wrote it and why. But the language suggests that it was, it was attacking Sabellianism. Sabellianism is that there's one God and he manifests in three different uh, ways. So the Father, and he manis- manifests himself as the Son, and or he manifests, manifests himself as the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Apostles' Creed is very Trinitarian, so it's probably attacking Sabellianism or Marcionism. It's probably the two heresies of the time. Um, we won't read that one today because... Uh, we read it we read it in church. But that's one of the ones you're going to see in our church services from time to time. Another one, obviously, is the Nicene Creed. Uh, this creed, this council, was brought forth because usually councils are addressing many different topics in the church. A lot of them are doctrines that are against Scripture, or the, or, and they want to discuss them. Is this what was taught? Is this what the apostles taught? The main heresy that, that we all know, right, is Arianism. Uh, and we kind of defined it. This is the idea that Christ was a creature, uh, was made and not begotten, because uh, Arius and his and his zealousness to defend um, the different parts of the Trinity went way too far <laughs> in saying, "Well, Christ is distinct from the Father because he's made, right?" Uh, and we can't that that breaks the chain of salvation if that's true. Um, so we have a, a, uh, a very early creed, and I want to read this. Um, and the reason I want to read, there's four, there's four creeds we're going to read, and I want to read them separately because um, I want to read them in their original format because you're going to see how they build on each other. That's very important because the Nicene Creed that we read in church is the final one, the, the Chalcedonian version of the Nicene Creed. And you're like, what does that mean? The, Chal- the, the Council of, of Chalcedon is, is really the fourth and final big council where uh, a creed that the church recites um, happens, right? So I want to read the original Nicene Creed and just show you uh, what, they, what they were uh, um, saying that Scripture teaches, and then we'll build on that. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, it's it's really trying. To, it's really letting everyone know this is why we use creeds and confessions. 
Um, the purpose of using them in a liturgy, because a lot of people are like, well, why is it important to put them in a liturgy? Um, and then which ones do we use as a church? Uh, Right. The church has allowed the church to make these guidelines and they have left the call. Right, and that's really, especially in, uh, in confessions, right? When we look at later in history when the, the confessions start coming about, this is really the church to be like-minded. Uh, because, and this is, this is where church history is, helps a lot. When the, the attack that Rome did after the Reformation, which is called the Counter-Reformation, when we look at the attacks, and that's where the Jesuits come from, when we look at the attacks of Rome on the church, um, it really is paramount that these local bodies come together and send out these confessions to, to unite the church in what they believe so they can attack uh, these counter-gospels that are, that are trying to usurp the Reformation. Um, and again, right, today we have all this information at the tip of our fingers uh, and we can, you know, if we want to answer a question, we can get it in five seconds. But that wasn't true then, right? Um, man, what do we believe? What do we believe on justification again? Ah, oh, man, how, and you, know, you got some Jesuit that comes up and, like, you know, turns you around with his knowledge of this and that. And you're like, ugh. Right? Now you got a confession right in front of you. Boom, I can, I can, I can come to that and refute you with, with what the church says. And now we can, now we can engage counter doctrines. And that's what we're doing with confessions. And creeds. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here's uh, here's the original Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, or in one only God, Father Almighty, Creator of things visible and invisible, and the Lord Jesus Christ. For He is the Word. He is the Word of God, God of God, Light of Light, Life of Life, His only Son, the firstborn of all creatures. Begotten of the Father before all time, by whom also everything was created, who became flesh for our redemption, who lived and suffered amongst men, rose again the third day, returned to the Father, and will come again one day in his glory to judge the quick and the dead. We believe also in the Holy Ghost. Uh, we believe that each of these three uh, is and subsists, the Father truly as Father, the Son truly as Son, the Holy Ghost truly as the Holy Ghost, as our Lord also said when he, when he sent his disciples to preach, go and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the original Nicene Creed. Um, you might, if anyone's familiar with the one that we say, you might notice that there's a lot of language left out regarding the Holy Spirit, right? All they say is, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And a lot of people will say, well, see, they didn't have any doctrine of the Holy Spirit then. Uh, that, was, that, that evolved later. Um, of course, that's ridiculous. They're not, the argument wasn't about the Holy Spirit. It was about Christ. Um, so um, that's the primitive Nicene Creed. Uh, the second council that is going to start adding to this is the Council of uh, Constantinople. Any questions while I'm looking that up? So I'll read, I'll read the, the second edition um, of this creed that comes out of the Council of Council. And you can look up its significance later. Um, for trivia's sake, uh, in the Council of Constantinople, this is when the Bishop of Constantinople was given the same, um, the same reverence as the Bishop of Rome. <laughs> so this is, this is the beginning of the fracture of East and West starts in this council. Uh, Rome, huh? 
Uh, this was uh, 381. Yeah, in 1054, and then they split in 1054. Wow. Yeah, this is this is part of the sowing of that seed. Uh, and and r by the way, Rome was not at any of these councils. <laughs> there is no representative of Rome here, so there wasn't like this idea that everyone bowed down to the Bishop of Rome. That didn't come till later. All right, so here's the second edition. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father, uh, before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary. So we have some incarnation language inserted here. So now this council is really looking at what, what, ha what is the incarnation? Um, who is who is Jesus Christ? Um, is he fully man and a little part of God? Is he fully God? Like is he is he like a, a human body, but like God controls his mind, um, something like that? Or is is he uh, is he God, but just draped over with human flesh? Um, this is the, so this is what they're talking about. Um, who was for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, regarding uh, again, recording to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life. So you see expansion on, on Holy Spirit language. And the Holy Ghost and the Lord and the giver of life who proceedeth from the Father and uh, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. Right. So now, so a lot of people were thinking that the Holy Spirit was just kind of like a force. Uh, you see that in Jehovah's Witness. Right. Um, so in our church. Right. Do we believe that the Holy Spirit, Spirit is a force? No. This is why we recite the Nicene Creed. This is what we believe about the Holy Spirit. When you hear our teaching, this is what we're, we're proclaiming to you. If you hear anything other in this pulpit or if you hear anything else in any other pulpit, it is anathema in the sense that it is, it is, that is not a true teaching. It, is, it belongs in the garbage heap. Um, and we believe in one, and this is start where we see uh, church language being brought in too. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you see, and what's interesting, you see language as far as resurrection is concerned, right? Because now we're talking, if we're talking about incarnation, now we're talking about, well, what do we get, right? If, if, if we're going to teach that Christ came as the Spirit, then what does resurrection look like, All right? So you start seeing this, this language being added. So you see, you can see even in this, the sequence of this, uh, of this, confession evolving, and, and I'll use that word in, in the religious sense, evolving into uh, covering all doctrinal bases and to say, this is basic Christianity. And it is so important to go to a church that's going to tell you, we believe in basic Christianity, right? Do I need a church to tell me about what they believe in baptismal, uh, who they believe should be baptized in the liturgy? No, I don't need a church to tell me that. Do I need a church to tell me, um, um, you know, what their uh, eschatological view is in the liturgy other than, right, Christ returns and we're raised from the dead bodily or something? No, I don't need to know that. Um, I, can go to a, I can go to a Reformed Dispensational Church. I can do that. That's fine. Right, Ritish? <laughs> Ritish can come <laughs> Ritish can come to a church that doesn't hold to dispensationalism, right? I mean, th this, isn't, this isn't the... the the box that we're we're drawing here, um, huh? Oh, sorry, sorry. Pre all right, uh, historic primo. Sorry, historic primo. Right? Sorry. Um, <laughs> He's Let's, hypothetically, if Ritish was any of those things. All right. So I'll read the final one, the Chalcedonian, the one that. Uh, the one that we're all usually mostly familiar with. Are you looking for the Nicene Creed? 
Nah, well, I'm looking for the Chalcedonian version. I had it bookmarked and I lost it. Actually, maybe I have it right here. Oh, yeah, I have it right here. Okay. Um, all right. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man of a reasonable, rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father. Consubstantial means um, co-essential. So, um, of equal likeness with the Father, right? According to the Godhead and the consubstantial with us according to manhood. In full likeness to the Father, in full likeness to man. So he's, they're defining the, the hypostatic union here. And all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these late latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, the Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, and separably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concerning in one person and one uh, uh, subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one in the same Son and only begotten, God of Word, uh, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the, whole, of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Um, if you see anyone say, like, uh, Jesus, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, this, this creed says, no, he's not. <laughs> this creed says, you can't talk about, you can't define um, Christ in that way. <laughs> is that the vacuum? No. Oh. Ours is that, too. Um, right. The, the whole point is we can't put a percentage on it. We can't. It's 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 uh, refining the language for us, right? It's saying you you can talk about the you can talk about the incarnation in these terms. You cannot talk about the incarnation in these terms because this is not what Holy Scripture presents the incarnation to be. We we know that God that Jesus is fully man because he has to resent, represent humanity. And again, he has to be fully God because only God can save. And we can't mishmash the natures. We can't make them schizophrenic, right? We can't have one nature swallowing up another nature. Uh, we can't divide the two natures. Um, and this is, this is what the council is saying. And this is really important because a lot of churches aren't careful with their language. So again, here's another reason why we have creeds and confessions in our liturgy. This actually confines the elders that are teaching you the words they can use to, to give you the, the orthodox gospel even. This goes back to what God are we worshiping, right? We're fully defining here what God we're worshiping in every aspect of the liturgy. You should, you should have no qualms or questions about uh, that you are worshiping the living God. Um. So again, how do we know that this church, this church gets accused of being a cult all the time? All the time, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh? By cultists. By cultists, yes. The, the cult of death and cult of the secular cult. Because we follow the liturgy. Because we follow liturgy, because we follow uh, the teaching of Christ, because we seek to conform our lives and his likeness in every, in every avenue of our lives. Because there's order. I think it's because they didn't believe that it could be lived out and, uh, and uh, applied. And, and if they call themselves Christians, that means that we can apply it to each other. Uh, they, want, they want you to think that uh, you can't apply it to anyone else. It's my own individual, personal Jesus. The 
this is my faith. This right. is my that no one's allowed to put that on me. Right. And tell me that that wasn't right. Right. And I really think that the thing that a huge factor of why they're why we would be called a cult is because we would actually say, Say you're a Christian but you don't act like it. Right. You leave it up to the people who are yeah. Right. This I think this that's why I read that 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 letter that the synod wrote to that crazy church, right? That church is saying, look, you're not living in any way according to what the gospel has binded you how to live. Um, your, 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 that church is literally a cult, right? It is, it, it throws off any, any restraints that the church has built up to this point. And even by then, even by 325 or 350, whenever that synod met, there were, there were, as many guardrails as there could be, even at that point. The church had had so many synods up to then. I mean, things they've even talking about, like, when should we, when should we celebrate Easter? Should it be uh, called Quattro Decimism? Should we, should we meet on the 14th of uh, Aviv? I thought it was Aviv. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, or do we, do we just worship it on Sunday, right? So there's so many guardrails and, 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 and uh, the church has come together to, to iron these things out, heresies that are, that are trying to be snuck in and that have been kicked out of the church, um, that we can conform our lives as, as Scripture commands us to conform our lives. And we can, we can prove that we are standing on the shoulders of the ancient church who commanded their people to do the same thing because we have literally their, <laughs> the church is commanding their people to live like Christians. And if you don't, you're not a church, and you're outside of, uh, of, the, of the temple of God, and you're on the path of the damnation. You and anyone that follows you, right? This is like the letter that Moses maybe wrote to Korah, right, before Korah said, I reject that, and then they got swallowed up. Um, that's the importance of having creeds and confessions, right? Uh, so when you see those in the liturgy, and by the way, a thing that's changing with our liturgies, right, you're going to start getting them a lot earlier. Next week's is posted already. I posted it before we, we got here tonight. Um, uh, like Al said, these, these confessions, especially the ones we're going through, the Heidelberg, the Belgic, the Cans of Dort, um, those, are, those will be hard to teach your kids. If you can get like a condensed version or a kid's version of that. Um, but yeah, but these are these are designed to help you train your children in the way that they should go, right? This is, this is a like-minded church uh, systematically saying, here's how you as a family can start teaching your kids the things of God and internalizing the things of God yourself as well, right? That's why when you see all, all the, the scripture uh, proofs that are with the question and answers, I hope you're not just going through the questions and answers. Open up the text and, and read what uh, those men had said, this is what supports our, our answer here. Right? This isn't just, again, hey, Bob, what do you, what do you think justification is? Oh, I think it's, you know, maybe it's salvation from, I don't know, uh, some sins but not all sins. Well, it, why would you say that, right? It's, it's not just opinions being thrown out here. These are, these are systematic uh, doctrine, doctrinal um, truths that we are given. So, um, that's the importance of having creeds and confessions in our liturgy. And you'll, you'll, you're, you're going to start seeing more of the Apostles' Creed, uh, more of the Nicene Creed. Uh, we might even do, maybe we'll do the, Chal the Chalcedonian uh, Creed at some point. It's not that long, too. But talking, that one's not really read that much. And then there's the Athanasius Creed, too. We didn't read that one. That one's super long. <laughs> um, uh, but that one's again talking. That's that's a Chris, uh, Christological creed, talking about uh, further further talking about. Barbara, Bar you read it last week, right? Yeah, talking about uh, who who is Christ in relation to the Father and the Spirit. Um, I'm going to end it there, and I want to open it up to comments, questions. You did tell me I belong to a cult when you came here. Well. We try to hide that as long as we can. <laughs> we we get our we get our teeth sunk in you, and then we'll tell you you're you're in a cult, by the way. So if you're a church, I have a question. So if you're a church and you don't have what you believe, so somebody can understand it, how do you call yourself a church without any kind of? If you 
call them guardrails or whatever you want to call them, creeds and confessions, how do you come up with what you believe if you don't have something that's been written down and hasn't been, hasn't been tested or hasn't been tested right. and has been put forth to uh, uh, theologians, scholars, elders, and brought forth to be tested and see if this is what the Bible teaches, how do you even call yourself a Christian? Right. It, and it doesn't, and sometimes it's just frustrating when I hear somebody say that about church, so church is a cult or, or, or whatever. You know, most, most churches are heterodox in the, in the basic sense. Right. And um, I think the Orthodox ones stand because they stand because they do have creeds and confessions and they do, they do have statements of, of fact. Right. Well, you hear you'll 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 hear the statement from those churches a lot. Well, there's no I have no creed but Christ. Um, that's that's usually the response you'll get. Um, of course, they just created their own creed by saying that. Uh, so do you, do you is that what you recite to people when they ask you that? Well, yeah. Like okay, <laughs> right. The synod of one, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, everyone everyone's. Everyone's going to base things off of a creedal statement, off of what they think Scripture is going to say. Um, the, the difference would be, yeah, um, they'll reject, they'll reject the, the creeds and confessions and say those aren't inspired, so we don't use them, while they just come up with their own creeds and confessions. So, uh, and I'll easily say, well, I'll, I'll put mine against yours. Um, I don't think mine are inspired either, but they're authoritative as far as they, they, say, they say what is true about what scripture says and uh we'll, we'll see which one stands the test of time <laughs> yeah they're, they're strengthened having 2,000 years of old scroll looking that's right and what we say we believe that's right, right. I think it was as recent as like a year ago where on our church website in the what we believe section we had a few paragraphs that had been written by someone around here at some point very decent paragraphs yeah so Brian and Jeff I think right probably Jeff yeah I think but they but they were not the creed they, they weren't just, the creed almost a virtuousness to independence, right? And unhitching from the church looks like rejecting their creeds and confessions. It looks like um, a rebellious teenager who thinks that they can, they've got all the answers, and they don't. So they need to go back to uh, the, the apostolic and historic church yeah. um, in submission right. to one another, right? Right, yep. Here, here, I'll go ahead, Ritish. But we believe, yeah. We believe, and that's one of the statements that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Yep. And the Summit Doctrine. Yep. Um, apart from that, um, all these documents say that this faith has been passed on, not individually, right. but by the fathers. Right. And uh, that's what um, um, the Book of Acts also says, that, you know, be in the doctrine of the apostles, and that doctrine is now elaborated for us in that creed. Right. I would like to give a uh, historical incident that happened in 15, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. You see it, yeah. An example of your country being lift, lifted out of Nestorianism. But Nestorianism is saying Nestorius. Some people think he was misunderstood, but essentially that because God is everywhere, God didn't need to come down in the body of a man, um, which is right. Is he is he captured it within the body of Christ, or is he everywhere so he doesn't need the body? And um, uh, and there's a lot more. Nestorianism is the the ancient version of Federal vision. <laughs> if you ask somebody to define federal vision, they're like, oh, well, Nestorianism is kind of the same way. But, um, it, but it is a heresy, right? Uh, and, and the fact that, uh, uh, anyway. So, the last thing I want to say, <laughs> last thing I want to say, um, if if we as a church we should be memorizing these creeds as well. When somebody comes up and asks you, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Right. Like, like, just, say it like, just in like, yeah, right. Stand up and like, yeah. <laughs> sit up straight. Don't look in their eyes. Look at the, yeah. Um, uh, it, it helps you summarize literally what you believe to somebody. Just look up the screen to the left. Yeah. 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 Sure. And again, if you, if you talk to a Mormon, right, and they say, well, we believe too, right? The, the, the creed in your mind, it's actually like, it's, it, it's the check, check marks. Get to somewhere where they're going to reject what you believe and then, and then start arguing. You believe in God the Father Almighty, <laughs> maker of heaven right? and, earth. and earth. And Jesus Christ is the only Jesus begotten Christ Son. The only begotten <laughs> right? Uh, begotten, not made, right? <laughs> begotten, not, that's where you'll stop. Here's, er, no, well, Jesus was a spirit child of Elohim and Satan's his brother. Well, let's start there and, and we can, you know, branch off from that. Um, but again, this is, this is how as a community we're going, we, we can deepen our faith uh, and deepen our relationships with each other, right? Um, coming, like, saying the creeds to each other, just, you know, helping each other memorize it or whatever. Uh, and and uh, anyway, um, Anything else? Well, there's, there's, uh, well, it's, there's uh, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Chalcedonian Creed, uh, Athanasian Creed is really what the so four, yeah, you can say four. If you go online, you can find a book. It's called the Three Forms of Unity. Yeah. There has a Hadaburg Catechism, the uh, the Creed, and then there's Nicene Creed, everything in there. And I'm gonna see if I have a copy of the house. Or yeah. If you go to, go to our church website, because we have the Athanasian, Apostles, Nicene, and then the Three Forms of Unity. So we don't have the Chalcedonian on there. Do we? Yeah. So what we do believe that we, we adhere to, we should probably add the Chalcedonian. Do um, you guys know the Chalcedonian? Yeah, I just read it. That was different than this one. You don't have a Chalcedonian on the website. Or no, I have it on my computer, but I'm just saying I have an app that has it. Oh. 
that one's probably included with the Nicene. The one I read was like the, um, the one that was addressing the incarnation. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 That, is that one even on our website? Uh, no, this is the one I would say it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yes, the autocast. Yep. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Have you heard of the Standard Creed? Standard Creed? It's called the Standard Creed. Who came out of that? Hey, just for fun, you guys might not find this fun like I do. Do you want me to read some of the like some of the canons that came out of the Nicene Creed? Some of them are pretty, pretty interesting. Huh? Yeah. A different council? What's the standard one? Oh, wow. It's pretty substantial. It's crazy. Listen to some of these uh, canons. They're pretty interesting. Um, of avoiding the conversation of evil workers and wizards, also of the penance of them that have not avoided such. <laughs> of the sponsors in baptism, men shall not hold females at the font, neither women males, but women females and men males. Uh, of the prohibited marriages of spiritual brothers and sisters from receiving them in baptism. Um... Clerics are forbidden uh, from giving a witness in criminal causes. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, this is this is the council where they uh, they came up with uh, not kneeling during prayer. Um, so uh, they they came to the conclusion that if, if we're praying because Christ was risen from the dead, so when you pray, you always stand, uh, and that's why we we stand. You just, we kind of do it in between. We do stand when we pray a lot. That's why we stand when we sing, because singing is prayer, praying. Um, the only prayer that we don't stand on is the prayer of confession, usually. What People will sit or kneel, um, which I'm not sure if uh, they, they go into that. But um, they also go into how to pay, how to honor um, bishops and, and, uh, and how to pay them. I thought that was interesting. Ah, burn it. Um, here's, a, here's a real interesting one. Do you think churches follow this? No bishop shall choose his own successor. Rick Warren, anathema. No, just kidding. He is anathema. But you see that? He like, had this big announcement. He chose his successor and all that. Uh, it doesn't say anything about women, so definitely women are part of that. Um, yeah, these are... All right. Um, Jesse, I think you prayed last week. Brent, will you pray for us? Yeah. Father, we thank you that you, you continue to bring us back uh, to your word, to your church, to each other. And so, Lord, um, already uh, two days removed from celebrating your resurrection and your Lord's Day, Father, our hearts are longing once again for the ability to come together and to worship you. And so we pray, Father, that that what we learned tonight would continue to penetrate our heart. Father, that our minds would meditate on these things, that we would learn uh, more about what we are doing on the Lord's Day and why, uh, and why other Christians throughout time have done the same thing, why we continue to keep coming to the same conclusions based on your word. And so, Father, um, without, uh, without fear, uh, of becoming Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, Lord, let us press into your truth that, that millions of other Christians have embraced and loved. And Father, help us to, uh, to read your word with fresh eyes and to not become robotic and uh, monotonous in the application of this uh, liturgical truth. Father, we thank you for Drake's work tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to fellowship with you and with each other. And we pray that you would uh, bless us as we uh, as we all go our different ways tonight until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Sammy, you can get up and play. I, I listened. You did a good job. Yeah, that was good. I can't walk to school.
Well, we go.